the thirteenth station. Jesus is taken down from the cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Up until this point in his passion, Jesus, Jesus has been handled most cruelly. He's been pushed, he's been, he's been prodded, he's been pressed up against and given a crown of thorns. He's been beaten, he's been scourged, and he is now hung on the cross, and even his side has been pierced by a lance. Jesus has been treated most cruelly, and yet... Christ's response to that was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And yet, here in this moment, we see something different. We see the great tenderness and the great compassion of those who are handling his body, who love him, who believed in him, who knew him as a friend, as a son, but also as their Messiah, as their Christ, as their Savior as the one to whom they put in all their hope. This scene of, of Jesus being taken down from the cross and being placed in the arms of his mother Mary, it always makes me think of those two great sculptures by Michelangelo. The first being the, the deposition of Christ, and the second being the Pietà. The first, the deposition of Christ, is a sculpture that you find in Florence. It's this wonderful sculpture of, of Christ's body being handed down into the arms of Mary, either by Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea. We know, we know that they had asked for, for Christ's body, and Joseph had opened a tomb for him. Nicodemus had come uh, to prepare his body with oils. And so too, there at the side is, is Mary Magdalene, who is faithfully at the side of Mary throughout this ordeal. We think of this great and tender image, and it all leads up to, well, the image of the Pietà, where at last we focus on, on that intense and that beautiful scene, that heart-wrenching and, and sad and difficult scene of Mary finally being able to embrace the, the body of her son, the very one that she had received in her womb at the invitation of the angel Gabriel, the very one that she had raised with Joseph in their home in Nazareth, the, the very one that she herself had believed in and knew by faith that he was to accomplish all that his father had set out before him, the one who uh, she had pointed to and, and asked and pleaded with at the wedding feast of Cana to begin his work, the one whom she saw perform miracles and do amazing deeds in the sight of God and indeed the sight of all. This one is now returned to her, given back to her. She gave him to the world and the world did with him what it, what it wanted. And now he has been returned back to her, dead, but completely drained, completely having given everything of his life. When we think of that name, Pietà, sometimes we think that it must mean pity, it must mean sadness, it must mean, um, well, great sorrow. And yet, Pietà actually comes from the word for piety, or faithfulness, or being dedicated. And we see that in this image. We see this in the sculpture. First and foremost, we see this in, in Jesus himself. The great faithfulness, the great dedicatedness that he had uh, allowed his life to, to be completely and utterly about the will of the Father. And giving everything being most pious, most faithful, and determined to give himself completely for the sake of his Father and for the sake of that mission. We see that in completion here. He has indeed given everything. 
But we also see that in the person of Mary. We see that in the person of his mother, who has given her complete self, who was there with him faithfully, most devotedly, all throughout his life, as his first disciple, as his disciple par excellence, as the one who was going to give her heart completely in union with the heart of her son. We see that here in her sorrow. We see that here in her giving over Christ for us. You see, that's something that I learned when I first took a tour of St. Peter's where this sculpture is. You learn that this sculpture was actually meant to be above an altar. It was meant to be a, above an altar where the priest would be saying Mass and would be offering the body and blood of Jesus our Lord. And you know the scene well when a, when a priest lifts up the, the Eucharist, when he lifts up the body, lifts up the chalice with the blood above and says, Behold, behold the Lamb of God. He's offering to the people for their adoration and ultimately for their communion to be drawn into the one who is being offered, who is being given to them through the church, through the priesthood, but ultimately through the divine and, and sacred heart of Christ. And part of that participation of giving over the body most definitely has to be Mary. Without Mary, we would have never received that gift. Without Mary, we would have never known the sacrament. Without Mary and, and her willingness to, to allow her flesh to be, to be borrowed by her son and so, and so become one with us, unless she allowed, well, Christ to, to be able to sacramentally be present in our world in that most wonderful and radical way, in the Incarnation, unless there was Mary, unless there was a mother, we would have never known the face of God and the face of Jesus. We would have never known his mercy and his love given to us in his flesh. And if you look at this sculpture, you'll see and you'll notice Mary isn't really holding on to Christ. She didn't receive the body of her son in such a way that she was going to grasp onto him and hold him tight and want him to stay with her. She's very willing and open-handed and allowing him, in a sense, to slide off of her lap onto the altar, onto all altars throughout the world, so that Christ and his givenness to the Father might continually be given given for the sake of the sins of many, given for the sake of the redemption of all. She is allowing her son to continue to be a gift. She is allowing Christ to, to continue to be a gift to all of us. Each and every time we celebrate the Eucharist at the altar, we receive that gift through her arms. We receive that gift from her hands. She who had the greatest of all faith, the faith that is the, the summary of the faith of the church. The faith that trusted that even though he has died, even though he has been defeated by death on the cross, that by his gift and by being continually given, he is going to share the victory of the resurrection with all of those who eat his flesh and drink his blood. May we look forward to that day when we can receive that gift anew, when we can receive that gift again, given to us from the altar, given to us from the Mass, given to us through the faith of the Church. May that day come soon, and may we, may we look forward to it, desire it, and ultimately open our hearts to be readied to receive Let us consider how, after our Lord had died, he was taken down from the cross by two of his disciples, Joseph and Nicodemus, and placed in the arms of his afflicted mother. She received him with unutterable tenderness and pressed him close to her bosom. Let us pray. 
O mother of sorrows, for the love of your Son, accept me as your servant and pray to him for me. And you, my Redeemer, since you have died for me, allow me to love you, for I desire only you and nothing more. I love you, Jesus, my love, and I am sorry that I have offended you. Never let me offend you again. Grant that I may love you always, and then do with me as you will. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.